And now it is time for our, our last talk in the official program. Have you always wanted to get an IT salary without time, effort, or money invested? Yes, of course. Do you want to fake your testing like a pro? Yes? Then let's not waste time and find out how to do that. Please welcome the famous testing troll who started his trolling speaker career from this stage. The last year. The last year winner of QA of the Year Awards, the testing thinker, teacher, and preacher, Victor Slavchev! Okay, I have my slides. For the next lecture, I would like you to imagine, why isn't this working? One second. Oh, fuck it. No? Can you hear it now? OK, there it is. So for the next lecture, I would like you to imagine me looking like this guy. Like if you're born past 2000, year 2000, perhaps you don't know who he is. I'm not sure if our friends from outside of Bulgaria know him. But uh, his name is Horst Fuchs, and he was quite a famous person in the teleshop stuff. Also, he was selling a lot of miracle stuff. So. I would like to present something of a sales pitch to you, which is not going to sell you anything really, but I would try to use the same energy at the same, the same way that he was expressing himself. Like I was thinking on probably providing myself with some sort of a requisite, like a, a baggy 90s shirt or maybe a lot of rings and earrings. But I was like, there is a stand-up comedian after me. I don't want to make him feel awkward. So. I will try this, I'll do my best. Are you tired of your testing job? Are you tired of being constantly mind boggled with all of this complicated stuff that you have to deal with? And all of that complicated task that you have to do daily, like this one, and even worse, and all of that knowledge that you have to accumulate and learn every time just to keep yourself on the top of the wave, and that's every day, and the technology always shifting from beneath your feet, do you have times in your career where you're so tired, so productive that you have to take a sleep on your desk or perhaps even crawl under it just to find a place to cry and weep and uh, sort of recover? Do you hate your job? Do you want to just reap the benefits but not invest anything in it? Well, my advice is it's time to stop. It's time to turn to something quite revolutionary, which will let you have all the benefits, but none of the downsides of the testing job. And this is faking your testing like a pro. Faking your testing like a pro is a revolutionary framework which will allow you to have all of the benefits and none of the downsides of being a software tester. You will be 10 times more efficient, people will like you, people will believe you're a star, and you will do all of this with non-investment on your end. You won't have to learn anything. You won't have to try to expand yourself in any manner. 
and you will have most important time for the important stuff. And I announced some of them, but I have a visual representation here what I mean by important stuff. And if you can't read it from the back rows, I will sort of summarize it to you. It's a person um, who declared on Facebook, of course, where else but Facebook, uh, that she forbids Bill Gates and his, uh, let's say, friends and uh, relatives to chip her with vaccines or any sort of uh, radiation. So yeah, important stuff, work. Important stuff, work. You don't want to invest your time in work, but in important stuff. So, in other words, you will be just like this man, like you will be betting in money. People will be, all of your friends are going to ask you for loans and all of your friends are going to sue you because you will be so fucking rich and famous for it. So, in order to achieve this, in order to become the most famous and the most developed tester in the area, I will provide you with a simple framework which only gives you a couple of strategies how to be successful software tester. So. The framework itself is called FART, and the D is silent. Like, yeah, there's so many silent Ds out there. And it stands for a couple of strategies that you have to implement in order to be a very successful tester. Like, the first one is fixate on automation, and that's nothing to do with fixing bugs and fixing anything. The next one is act as if anything you do is important testing stuff. Like, you go to the toilet, you're missing for 30 minutes, your legs are already going to get numb a little bit, but you are doing important testing job and you're producing an important testing artifact. And in, in fact, if you were reading pull requests from GitHub and some automation code lately, you probably found out that many people are taking this advice quite by heart, I guess. So the next one is religiously follow the process. And the process is with capital P, so we will discuss this uh, a, bit, a bit later. The next one is test just the bare minimum. You don't want to invest too much, like you don't want to spend too much time. As I said, you, don't, you only want to reap the benefits, you don't want to take the downside. So too much work, you know, overworking yourself, that's not for us. And of course, deliver, 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 get obsessed over deliverables. So let's sort of untangle what all of these mean. First is, fixate over automation. And fixation here is used in the term that probably psychologists are using it. And you know, I'm not a specialist in psychology, so I did my research. I opened Wikipedia and Google and Urban Dictionary. Um, and what you, what you get as a definition of fixation is probably the unhealthy attachment to something which is normally not not explained with a, lot of, uh, with a lot of good detail. So you don't have a reason to be attached to something, but you are anyway. And I believe if you want to be um, successful in our craft, you have to be fixated on automation for no reason. And it's quite easy if you assume a couple of really simple stuff, like, for example, that there is only one solution to all problems, and they are called automation. And you can even pick a favorite too. You don't have to have to actually be good at too many stuff. Like you can pick, practically just pick one, two, stick with it. You don't really have to be very good at it. Perhaps you'll do just enough to be a rock star. And of course, you don't even have to go very deep in knowing the two and like be a great tester and stuff because normally automation people go with just knowing something like a language or a framework or anything else. So. There is this guy, uh, Abraham Maslow, uh, who is famous for his pyramid of the necessities, and he used to say stuff like, if you, the only tool that you know how to use is a hammer, every problem or anything that you encounter will look like a nail. And it's quite sad, but in our industry it seems like there is a lot of these hammer testers which only know how to use one thing and they are running around banging stuff quite literally perhaps, uh, banging stuff, thinking as if they are nails. And it's easy to spot it, like go to the schedule of any conference and you will see that most of the talks that people are presenting are merely a how-tos. Like you are going and you will see something like how to perform the X type testing with a Y tool, or how to upgrade this stuff, or how to install Selenium Hub or whatever. So. As I said, you can really uh, progress if you're acting as such a hammering tester or a hammer tester. 
And these Hammer testers are normally keeping it very shallow. They're only discussing the simple stuff, the, the obvious stuff, the, you know, the surface stuff. And some of them are not actually a quite good testers, and we'll probably discuss this a little bit further. Uh, some of them are sort of acting like a testing prima donnas because they don't like writing their tests their own. They prefer hiring lackeys that will write tests for them so they can only code it. So it seems like a gold mine, is the way as I see it. So if you want to be successful, you have to be fixated on automation for no reason. And to be quite honest, like these people normally just demonstrate that they are struggling very hard with tools and that they can hardly produce meaningful testing. But of course, who am I to judge? Like, if that's your future and that's what you believe should be your future, you can do it quite well. And the next one, act as if everything you do is an important testing problem. Like, it's a quite amazing thing what we are doing, and uh, there, is, there is a huge variety of talent in our area, and that's something that I'm completely serious about. And uh, you can see from the profile of each, and, of each and every person in this room that there is an amazing variety of people and backgrounds uh, in the quality assurance area. And I know from my personal experience that there is people here who were uh, perhaps fixing something in their previous job or uh, cooks or I was a, a call center operator and a paintball referee and all that kind of stuff. So all of these brings a lot of different perspective and that's quite something in our craft, because such people are kind of the interesting one. You know, the typical techies, they only want to solve problems in a technical manner, but people with a, especially with a humanitarian background, they think on stuff from the different perspective. And the last talk was kind of demonstration for this. So, and that's something quite important. As our sensei in martial arts was uh, use, used to say, if you only know something about one thing, you don't really know anything. Like, if you're only good at chemistry, you're not good at anything, even at, at chemistry at all. So it's same with quality assurance and the uh, testing. Like, if you're only good at testing, you're probably not even good at this one. So if you want to be good at testing, you have to understand development as well. You have to understand uh, programming, like you inevitably deal with programming at some point of your career. You have to understand infrastructure because eventually you will own it or you have to support it or anything similar. You will have to deal with human interactions, unfortunately, like you have to discuss with people. Sometimes they will try to bullshit you. You have to learn how to maintain a meaningful argumentative, uh, argumentative uh, discussion. You have to sort of learn diplomacy and all that kind of, of, of stuff. So, yeah, like, um, it seems like our craft is a mixture of technical and humanitarian skills, and it's quite hard to find people who are good at both. But that's quite amazing about our job, because people are interesting and they find interesting bugs. Like, they come from their own area, let's say that, that was finance or something else, and they see stuff from different perspectives. They find interesting bugs. They're the one different opinion around the table uh, which predominates all of the same opinion that normally try to solve problems with tools or anything similar. So, um, and that's, that's quite awesome. That's the, the greatest part about our craft, but that's just in case that such people are using their skills and their knowledge for the good. If they decide to go to the dark side, they can kind of switch and turn things in a very bad manner. And this is normally uh, happening when, like, if we want to be honest, a lot of people coming to our industry uh, don't come just because they're passionate about testing, some of them just because of the high salary. And that's completely normal, like, we don't judge these. Um, everyone wants a bigger house, everyone wants a, a bigger car or better car. Uh, so we don't judge them, but at some point, they're probably not very passionate about their job, and they decide that they'll have to steer it a little bit towards something which is more interesting to them. And they're normally not very technical, and they prefer stuff like soft skills, they prefer stuff like uh, human interaction, like teamwork, and sometimes, uh, for the worse, they end up in management. So we have this uh, weird situation in which a person who was never very passionate about their work is now a manager and makes decisions for the importance of testing without actually understanding it. And that's kind of a problem for me. That's for me like someone trying to drive a bus from the back seat or uh, like uh, giving a match in a, you know, a tube of gasoline to a child and saying, just go and play with it. So, 
very often you will see at conferences people you know, uh, sneaking topics like soft skills and uh, imposter syndrome and how to deal with it, or uh, uh, how to uh, do teamwork and stuff like that. And there is sometimes quite uh, extraordinary topics, like uh, quite honestly political, uh, politically colored topics, and uh, sometimes even like, you know, whatever is bothering you, just go and put it on the stage. And uh, especially for the imposter syndrome, very often I see this on conferences and I'm like, I don't want to be harsh, but like perhaps what you're experiencing is not imposter syndrome, but it's just a consequence of the fact that you were never passionate about your work and you're just realizing that yourself. So such people normally just steer the conversation from the important stuff towards side topics and they sort of work around the big pink elephant in the room that nobody likes to address, which is that our jobs is imminently complex and we can hardly do anything about it. And it is complex because it's not like the techies will tell you. Like, you will see many people coming on this stage saying stuff or grabbing stuff from the area of technology or the area of uh, automation, stuff like uh, uh, pipeline or CI, CD and all of that stuff. But you know, what we're doing as testers is not a production line. We don't, it's not a production line in Toyota where everything is automated and you just wait for a certain period of time and a bunch of robots are putting it together and there you go, you have a car in 15 minutes or in half an hour. Like, imagine the, in, in the testing, testing scenario, imagine that uh, the line of Toyota doesn't produce the same car every time, but they have to produce a different car every time. And once it has to be an SUV, and the next time it's a pickup truck, and the next time it's a motorcycle, and uh, the next time someone runs in and says, like, don't grab that seat, put the other ones, the red ones, but they have to be swayed, and you know, you don't put the steering wheel. The client will come and they will drive, and you will have to assemble it on the way out. So, yeah, normally testing goes like this. It's a very, very different animal from simply producing stuff. And of course, some element of uh, automation is always useful and it's always a good start, but it's not this, uh, solving all the problems. So, in essence, if you want to be successful, keep it on the shallow end. Just try to sneak in everything which is barely related to software testing. Try to, if you're just a little bit more assertive, just a little bit more uh, good, of a, good of a speaker, probably you can just sneak it in without any issues. So, next one. Religiously follow the process with a capital P. So what is the process? Every company has a process or desires to have a process. Like small companies, they normally desire a large enterprise process because they see these large companies like Google or Amazon or you name it, who are having this greatest process and everything is running peachy with them. And you have the big companies who essentially just have a process and you can barely go to the toilet without following some process or a procedure. And if you're clever enough, you can use the process in your advantage. How you can use it? Well, you can practically just blame the fucking process for everything. Like, if the process is dumb and it's not useful for anything, you can blame the process and you can say stuff like, man, I was doing my best, but the process is so inefficient, so I can practically do anything. So that's one way. Other way is just, if the process is complex, of course, you can just pretend that you were confused. Haven't you seen these guys? Like, uh, the release is on Friday and he's working on something since two weeks and at some point someone goes and says, can you demonstrate what you've done so, re so far? And he's like, oh, I was blocked. And you're like, why didn't you tell anyone? Well, I was confused. So the guy was just sitting there like a mouse, trembling and not bearing to, to do anything. So yeah, you can blame the process. And by the way, uh, it's an efficient way to just how to work. And, uh, not do anything uh, if you're good enough. Like, even if you're not right, you can just blame the process. Haven't you encountered such a case in which, for example, uh, you lock a defect in a Friday, 4.30, and uh, five minutes later, or even five seconds later, you receive a message from Jira saying, can't reproduce, and the developer's gone, and you have to wait until Monday. And you find them Monday, and you sit next to them, and you say, like, bro, Let's see what's going on, like, try to reproduce it. And he follows the steps and everything's fine. And you're like, what's not reproducible? And he's like, I don't know. So yeah, 
E even if you're not right, you can practically halt everything if you just follow the process. Because not following the process takes a lot of guts. It takes a spine, and it, it, it takes being kind of a rebellious person. And stupidly just mindlessly following the process will sometimes and very often run you into the situation in which the process, you follow the word of the process, the letter of the process, but you are going against the spirit that the process is trying to incorporate. And very often you will be part of a company which follows a certain process and nobody knows what they're doing. Nobody knows what, what's the higher purpose that they're trying to follow. And that's the reason why people feel so insecure and so weird uh, around processes. Uh, so processes have to evolve. Uh, we are operating in systems. We humans form systems, and these systems change. They grow, they merge, they split. Sometimes the members of these systems are uh, acting in a weird way, so they have to change, and the processes in which, the, uh, which operate in this system have to change as well. So at this time, you need a rebellious person to just stood up raise their head uh, above the grass and say something like, guys, what we're doing now is stupid. We have to change it, otherwise we won't progress. So, dealing with process is weird. It's, it's, it's complicated. You have to take responsibility. If you don't want to take responsibility because it's hard, it takes time, it takes effort, and you have to be kind of a a rebellious person, you can just keep it on the safe side and dodge all responsibility. And other thing is that, that you can do in order to progress is just to be a tester which tests things very, very literally and tests only the bare minimum. You can do this quite easy if you're only testing the obvious stuff. Like, you go to a testing conference and you will see that lots of people are just doing the obvious tests. Like, all conferences are showing tests of login pages. If you find a bug in a login page, you should go to that guy and tell him to resign and to go to bake burgers in McDonald's because he's probably a failure for his company and for whatever he's showing. Because everyone's showing uh, tests of, uh, of login pages. Like, it's always the obvious stuff, man. Like, they're always displaying only the obvious stuff. So if you want to be successful, do the obvious stuff. Like, nobody's going to bother you with anything more in depth because just not, nobody wants to bother with it anyway. So take stuff literally. Don't bother with stuff like details or comp complex stuff or trying some, some self-reflective stuff like, is this, is this enough? Have I done enough testing? Like, is this the best way that I can produce tests or Probably I can approach it in some other manner. No, 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 that's too much work for you. Like, that, that, that's philosophical stuff for you. So keep it on the safe side, and that's it. And it's quite helpful as well, because uh, our industry seems to believe that testing is an easy job. And testing is an easy job because of a very classical outsider-insider problem. And it's quite easy to comprehend, like, every expert activity which is carried by a, by a educated professional seems easy if you're just taking a look from the outside. Like, if you go to Turkey and you go to one of the baklava places and you will see the master doing this great sheet of dough and throwing it uh, above his head and the thing is spinning. And if you take a look at it, it's quite easy, man. But if I try to do it, I'll probably have baklava in my ears and uh, all over my head and all of that stuff. So yeah, it seems easy if... Uh, Messi is playing football, you know, if you're drinking beer on your, with your big belly on the, on the couch and uh, you're eating chips, yeah, it seems easy. So in the same manner, driving the car seems easy if you're from the back seat or from the side seat, but the moment that you have to sit in it and take the responsibility in, for it, it's kind of different. So there is this other uh, psychologist called Daniel Kahneman who, in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, was discussing a bias, uh, which is called what you see is all there is. And uh, that's the capability of people to uh, be able to produce statements or conclusions based only on the information that they're already having, like having under their hands, not thinking about the information that they're lacking or the information that uh, they might obtain, like the different perspectives, the missing piece of the puzzle. So uh, it seems to me like in our industry, people are very inclined of making such a quite easy, quite uh, small uh, scaled statements based on not enough information. And 
If we were discussing something or if you read something uh, in my blog, you could probably see me very often speaking stuff like, I like science and I believe that science or, or testing should be applied in the same way as science is. And uh, the reason for that is because in science, people are actually approaching stuff with a lot of scrutiny every time that somebody, make, somebody makes some uh, discovery. Like, the first thing that a scientist uh, faces if they make a discovery is a lot of uh, doubt and a lot of scrutiny. Like, people will doubt their methods, they will doubt their results, they will doubt their uh, environment, the way that they set it up and the way that they produced it. And in that matter, in that regard, if we take a look at testing, we are more like religion, man. Like, people just trust stuff, and people normally should be uh, way much more experimentally oriented and way much more uh, aligned with uh, trying to provide meaningful information. So, in that regard, I believe we can pull a lot from science. But of course, if you want to be on the safe side, just follow the obvious stuff, and you'll be just fine, or at least nobody's going to bother you with anything else. So the last part, deliver, deliver, deliver. Get obsessed over deliverables and you're going to be just fine. And it's quite easy to grasp this one. Like, go to any company meeting, uh, see what your manager is speaking about when they are speaking about quality, and this will be a quite distinctive list of what you have to care about any time that you speak about quality as well. Normally, they will say stuff like, we have improved our quality quite significantly. We have 200 test cases more, we have 15% better coverage, and we have 10% better ratio of open to closed bugs, or something along, around that lines. And you have your definitive list, what is important for your company and for your management. They don't care about stuff like how many bugs are out there and the client complaining about them. They don't care about, they normally care about uh, numbers, which makes it quite easy for you. If you want to just simulate stuff, just focus on these numbers, and this is normally what's going with companies. So, don't be surprised, or may your uh, surround, surrounding people not be surprised if every time that you hear uh, your manager speaking about quality, you make this face. Um, and why are you making this face? Why are you doubting uh, the information that they are providing? Because perhaps you know, uh, and sometimes you know it from first hand, it takes only one bug which is important enough or one security vulnerability which is big enough to bring your system down. And it doesn't matter if you're running on-prem or uh, in your grandmother's machine or in the last piece of art uh, serverless containerized uh, AI, ML, whatever state of art uh, system, like one bug is enough to bring your system down and everyone knows that. And it takes, takes one client who is unhappy to, uh, to draw a, lot of, a, a large portion of your client away from you. Like I've literally heard this story of a client saying stuff like, if you don't fix your fucking problem, I have a lot of influence in this area and I will tell all my partners not to work with you because you fucking suck. And what you do in that uh, situation? Well, you do nothing. You practically bend over, grab your toes, and you have to fix your bugs because otherwise you are simply screwed. And the last one, it takes one test that you don't, didn't run, which is important enough to skip an issue, which is, as I said, or a risk, which is, as I said, as important and as huge of an impact. So the devil's really in the details. It's not about silly metrics. So silly metrics are actually useful. You can use them to find information. And information is important for making decisions. But metrics are not decisions themselves. Don't just uh, bury your face uh, and, and head within metrics. So at this point, uh, it's important to make a conclusion or perhaps uh, you know, sales pitches at this point say stuff like, call us now, uh, order two, get one for free, or something like this, pay for two, get one for free. I really hope that all of you are getting sarcasm and irony, because nothing of this was uh, intended to be real, like I don't want to make you a lazy, uh, stupid son of a bitch who is not uh, doing anything about their career. Uh, but, you know, if you just follow the trend, isn't always the greatest choice about your career. And a person has to be quite uh, rebellious in order to be successful in our craft. And most of it, you need a sense of humor. Like, you need a great sense of humor to thrive in software testing, because otherwise, you're just uh, lost. You're going to lose your mind. And of course, 
why do people buy bullshit so, so easy? Um, and, uh, well, if you imagine that you're in the same situation, like these two booths are uh, uh, in front of you, and you're just a person who doesn't know anything about software testing, uh, and you go to them and you tell them, like, what is software testing about? Can you, can you teach me? And the one booth will tell you something like, oh, man, that's, that's, that's a hard thing. Like, you have to invest a lot of time. You need uh, qualified personnel. Uh, you have to learn a lot of stuff. The quality of your job, no, no. Okay, I'll start from the beginning. Um, so, yeah, it's, 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 it's hard. Like, you go to these people and they're like, it's hard, you have to learn stuff, you have to develop yourself, you have to learn technology. Uh, and, you know, people are going to hate you for what you're doing. Like, you're going to tell them that they have bugs and they have issues and it, it's for the greater good and they will just fucking hate you because they don't like receiving negative feedback. And you have to uh, be always up to date with the latest trends and you have to learn new technologies and all of that stuff. And at the next boot, they go to the person and he's like, ah, that's easy, man. You just define the use cases and the test cases and then you automate them and then you can go drink coffee and uh, write stupid statuses on Facebook. And who are you going to believe? Like, at least you can try with the cheaper one and with the easier one. And that's how our industry ended up with this situation. So, the role of the Joker. Um, the Joker is a quite interesting uh, character in culture and in literature and in art because the Joker, the Joker, the jester or the clown was the only person, at least in, let's say, Middle, middle Ages, who was allowed to mock the king and to give them negative information without being too afraid of losing their head. So true comedy and true... Uh, laughter, they were able to sort of give the bad news uh, to people. And by the way, this is the way in which the testing troll appeared as well. Because people take it too personally when you go to them and you tell them something like, you're incompetent, you're lazy, and you're trying to, to fool yourself that things will just work if you use tools. So if you sort of distort this from the speech of a fictional character and you try to make it a comical one, people are laughing at this uh, and people feel good about it because uh, they realize some imperfections about themselves. And sometimes they realize that they are surrounded by clones or sometimes they realize that the clown is looking at them from the mirror. Thank you very much. I promise that I will answer questions on Discord uh, personally, so no need to read them now. Is there any questions from the audience? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so uh, this one is a, cl a classic uh, QA question. So uh, how would you answer on the uh, topic on how much testing is enough and when do you determine that a task is ready for a review or for release for that matter? If I have to uh, repeat David's answer, it depends. Like, it depends on who you ask. Like, if you ask a tester, no testing is enough. If you ask me, I can test forever unless at least I get bored or I uh, don't have anything else. Uh, there is a thing called stopping heuristics, which you can use when you're sort of doubtful on how much testing you need to invest. Some of them are, for example, you don't find any defects. Some of them are you're out of time, you're out of resources, you're out of uh, uh, 
Perhaps I can find the full list of testing, uh, testing stopping heuristics uh, and, and post it in Discord in the uh, questions to the speakers channel. But essentially, it depends. Normally, uh, and I believe that's the case uh, more, of, more frequently, people are supposed to sort of orient themselves uh, given some uh, outside constraints, like, for example, time, money. And normally, testers are, are always short on time, always short on resources, and somebody is knocking on your door uh, when you're going to test this one, uh, and you're like, I didn't know I have to test it at all. And you have to do it within a couple of minutes. Uh, as I said, on the fly, while the car is driving, someone has to assemble the wheel and all of that stuff. So. Yeah, essentially this one. And uh, my suggestion is do as much as you want, do as much as you can. Uh, nobody's going to uh, like... Uh... Actually, developers are quite upset when you're testing too much, and they will say stuff like, this is a corner case. No, it's not a corner case, man. Like, if it's there, people are going to do it. So, yeah, anyway. Any other questions? Okay, well, see you later, and uh, have a nice time drinking beer. Thank you, Victor. And in the next break is your last chance to put your stamped passports for the big prizes. And now, break. Last beer break. <laughs> See you. In